Okay, great. Good. As I mentioned, I'm the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator. I usually like to have a lot of really cool resources. That is my spotted lanternfly headband. My job is uh, federally funded through the US Department of Agriculture, so their Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. I am uh, the coordinator for education and outreach for any federally regulated forest pests. So you're starting to see uh, that crazy character of invasive. That is all of the federally regulated pests. It's kind of a, a kid-like cartoon that highlights um, gypsy moth, Asian longhorn beetle, emerald, emerald ash borer. And you can see we have a lot of resources. So the next time we do get together, I will make sure that I bring them along and share them with you. Also, this is a cherry bark champion tree that we saw last week. My job is to help protect trees like this. It's always great to be able to plant and care for trees, but you know, to be honest with you, I'm more interested in conservation. So I wanna conserve those trees that we have. We wanna make sure that we keep them healthy. Recently, I graduated uh, with a master's in natural resources and environmental science, and I did my uh, graduate research on jumping worms. So if you are at all interested in jumping worms, I am always happy to chat about that, uh, but I really appreciated the support from the Morton Arboretum. I've been at the Morton Arboretum uh, in education and in outreach for the last 12 years and more specifically, uh, last six years in this position. So what you're seeing on the screen right now, we're gonna kind of just step back. I'm gonna pull back a little bit and kind of take a look at this 1950s uh, uh, graph on E. Lucy bronze forest region. So in the state of Illinois, we had that beautiful oak hickory. We also had a Western sort of uh, mesophytic uh, portion of it. But the majority of the trees, the hardwood trees in Illinois is that oak hickory component. I apologize for my, uh, my it, clicker is not working as well as I want it to. Hmm. Oh, Chris. All right, that's back. All right, let's see if this one works. Okay, so what you're seeing here is, you know, the dominance of the percentage of oaks in the important species in the Eastern and in the Midwest. I think this is a really interesting um, map. So we can see the state of Illinois and the percentage of oaks are really concentrated down in the Shawnee, that Southern Illinois. So also an another graph would also kind of show the, the change, if you will. So we're looking at, kind of what, how important, what percentage of our hardwoods are actually oak. And then we're looking at those uh, of actual, the um, decline. So we've had a lot of fragmentation. We've had a lot of loss. Obviously we are the prairie state um, and industrial um, revolution didn't help anything. We've got trains, we've got rail, we've got airports. So you can see how uh, the percentage of oak is starting to decline, certainly significantly from the 1800s you know, up until now. Over the last, um, I would say five years, I believe that our percentage of the oak hickory is stabilized. Uh, we're not seeing so much widespread decline. And a lot of that is because uh, you know, we're landlocked, if you will, certainly up here. Um, oaks are our foundational keystone species. I love this slide, over 500 species of insects feed on our oaks. Look at all these beautiful birds. We've got a um, tremendous amount of fungi that depend on it, blue spotted salamander. Um, we wanna make sure that we keep our oaks healthy. And I would be lying if I said I was, uh, I'm very concerned about the health of our oaks and certainly the health of our oaks throughout the state of Illinois. What you're seeing here is the invasive species invasion curve. So normally I have a, a different image, but I kind of wanted to go back to this more technical one. So on the graph over on the left-hand side, down in the, in the bottom, you have prevention. So prevention is the most effective uh, way to conserve all of our tree species. So we want to make sure that we have the least amount of time and the least amount of area and the least amount of, uh, of uh, costs associated with it. So you see the control costs over on the right hand side and then the time as that curve goes up. Typically this is probably a 15 year curve. So if you think about uh, gypsy moth, 
we're we're looking at preventing it. So don't move firewood. So let's keep our firewood local so we're not moving egg masses. And with gypsy moth, especially because gypsy moth is really truly um, a favorite host, oak trees are a favorite host of gypsy moth, eradication is not cost effective. There is no way that we're going to be able to fully eradicate gypsy moth from our forests and our oak woodlands. And we're, what we're doing basically, if you move up the curve, you're looking at that containment. So our slow the spread program, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, that containment program or that containment uh, focus is really effective when it, we talk about gypsy moth. Long-term management, long-term management is you're just trying to protect those trees that you have here. Typically, if you look somewhere between five to seven years, that's basically when we start to notice that there's a pest threat. So what we're trying to do is make prevention and early detection a bigger part of our monitoring. It's a tough life for an oak tree. I kind of feel a little bummed out because you guys are all talking about what's in bloom and everything is beautiful. And I'm gonna be talking to you a lot about the pest threats and diseases of our oak trees. But you can see bur oak blight, anthracnose, I don't worry about it. Uh, oak leaf blister, don't worry about that e either. Oak wilt, I'm really, really concerned about, certainly on the western edge of the state. Oak wilt is everywhere in, in Illinois. I, I would imagine that every single county has a positive confirmation of oak wilt. There's some really good research being done in Texas and in Wisconsin and Michigan. And I'm hoping that in the next year or two, uh, that we'll be able to be, highlight some new treatment trials for oak will. Um, oak decline, I probably should have moved oak decline to the top of that list. Oak decline is the number one thing that I am most interested in. I spend a lot of time thinking about it and I spend a lot of time out in the field looking at uh, different field identifications and trying to see if we can narrow down that really first early sign of decline and get that tree some help before we lose it. So in a healthy tree, if you go in the top part, you've got predisposing factors. So potentially you could have uh, you know, a, a fungus or you could have uh, root compaction. And then inciting factors might be drought or maybe too much weather. And then you have like a contributing factor would be uh, root rot, butt rot, um, a malaria root rot. We're seeing a lot of root rot right now on our oaks. This is just another uh, better image of looking at the predisposing. So making sure that those trees are planted right and they're planted right the first time. So we wanna minimize compaction and we wanna make sure that we're really aware of water changes. Over the last probably 10 to 15 years, we've had an increase in these heavy precipitation rain events. So anything more than two inches in a short period of time is considered to be a heavy precipitation event. So we've also got our inciting factors like gypsy moth, or forest tent caterpillar. I uh, don't think jumping oak gall is a big uh, factor. Uh, certainly in populations kind of crashed a little bit. Three years ago, we saw, saw a lot of jumping oak gall. And then kind of that one-two punch, who comes in, that two-line chestnut borer comes in and finishes, it finishes that tree off. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about two-line chestnut borer because I feel like two-line chestnut borer is, is really a pest that we need to be concerned about and certainly be aware of those early signs. Any of the root rots, you're starting to see those stringy mats underneath the, the bark of that tree, you know that tree's on the way out. Decline over time, this is a very familiar scene that we've seen. This is just about a year. Over on the left-hand side, you're looking at that kind of really tight leafing structure that's really tight on that trunk. That is a sign that this tree is stressed. And, and not only is that a sign, but you're looking at that thin canopy, that top part of that tree that's really, really thinning out. That is you know, a sure sign that the tree needs to be evaluated by a trained arborist. And over on the right-hand side, basically that tree is dead. I mean, granted, believe me, you know, I, there's a lot of sod there. I don't, I mean sod, there's a lot of turf there. So there's could be other factors that are going on, but this is a fairly common scene that we've seen uh, in and around our urban areas. Call this the triangle of death. You have to have all three. So you have to have a host, you have to have a con conductive environment, conducive environment, the pathogen, and then you get that disease. 
over on the right hand side, I mentioned to you, you know, Amalaria root rod or butt rot. You know, and that tree has that much, you know, um, a fungus that's growing on the outside. That tells me that that tree is on the way out. I mean, I would be surprised if it's not hollow and rotting from, you know, from other areas. That tree is probably not planted properly for the first time. So we need to make sure that we get these trees in tree pits and areas where they can uh, have a long, healthy life. So I love this picture. I have Galls are my favorite, and I'm just going to have to, you know, bear with me as we talk about it. Galls are not necessarily something that would kill a tree. So oaks have an unbelievable association with galls. You can almost identify a type of oak tree based on the gall. And they have, they have co-evolved over the last 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 years. If you look back on all these old botanical drawings, you start to see these oak depicted with these galls. So over on the top uh, left-hand corner, that oak apple gall, and then over on the top right-hand corner, that jumping oak gall, that jumping oak gall really just looks like towards the end of the season when those oak, um, when those galls actually pop off of the leaf because they have like a little, little nematode in it, they kind of shake around. You'll see the tree looks like Swiss cheese. Down on the lower left and the lower right, these are the two that I'm really gonna uh, focus on. Gouty oak gall and then horned oak gall. And Chris Evans, I think I gave you photo credit for your wonderful pictures that are on Facebook. Um, there it is, photo by Chris Evans. That is unbelievable, it's mysterious, it's scary, and yet I look at it and I just want to know more. So when you start to see trees that have gouty oak gall, horned oak gall, or even rough bullet gall, rough and smooth bullet gall or twig galls, um, you know, this is a real concern for me because I'm concerned about fine twig dieback. So basically over on the right-hand side, if you've got these galls, these uh, horned oak galls that take two years to actually develop and they start choking off that fine twig, that's gonna stress this tree out. So where possible, if it's, if it's doable, I like to make sure that these galls are removed from the trees during the dormant season. So we can start to give these trees a little bit of a leg up. There's another image, the Chris Evans. This is his photo, the one on the right as well. So the gouty oak gall and horned oak gall are the two galls that we really are concerned about in the state of Illinois. And basically the cinnab wasp takes its piercing mouth part and actually pierces the stem into the growing tissues, if you will. And all of a sudden the plant tissue responds. And so it creates this beautiful, healthy home for uh, the, the larva of the wasp. And if you think about it, the plant, it's like a mosquito bite. All of a sudden, you know, you get a mosquito bite and your body, you know, starts to just create a real bump, trying to isolate and contain, you know, that area where the mosquito bit you. Very, very similar to this, that plant tissue response. But it's so cool to think that that specific wasp could, could find this specific a host and then utilize that host in order to complete its life cycle. And typically they're one year or they could be two years. So gouty oak gall and horned oak gall are the two galls in Illinois that I am most concerned about. And if you do see them during the non-growing uh, season, that dormant season, the winter season, if you could prune them back out, you know, if you can make sure that you're anywhere from, sometimes I like to say 12 inches, if that's doable, but you wanna make sure that you are beyond. So you're, you're gonna prune that uh, gall back closer to the branch or the, the, the trunk of that tree. Round bullet gall is the one that is giving me real pause, certainly up here uh, in Northern Illinois and in, and in Southern Illinois, I saw it as well. Uh, what you're seeing over on the left-hand side is a brand new baby oak that we had planted. And this thing is just chock full of round bullet gall. So these gall wasps like to stay where they have a lot of opportunity to lay eggs. And so the easier it is for them to lay eggs, 
whether it's on the twig or on the, the, the stem, uh, the more likely they are to stay around. Also, if this is kind of a, in a protected area and there's not a lot of wind, you typically find uh, these galls that can stay in and really, truly just attack a tree. So there's a closer up image. One of the cool things about these galls, and if you, you know, if you don't remove them, that's fine because they end up getting recycled by other insects. So it, it is a kind, of, it is a cool association with our oak trees. But like I said, the image on the left, you know, what I'm going to do when I get back to the arboretum, I'm going to be go out there, find that tree, and start removing them so that we can uh, make sure that that tree grows into a nice, healthy oak tree. Oak decline. So over on the right hand side, you're starting to see these images. They're so familiar. That fine twig dieback. So the top part of that crown is dying. Over on the right hand side, it looks like a bottle brush. It's all shrubby. That tree is sending out as much leaf area as it possibly can in order to capture as much energy in order to stay alive. Um, the image over on the lower right hand side, you know, that's the one two punch. That's the true two line chestnut borer coming in and kind of closing it off. Stress can lead to decline. We're starting to see when we have these heavy periodic rain events where you've got flooding, you've got soil saturation. I mean, if you start to think about what's going on around you and then kind of looking at the health of the trees, it oftentimes these trees can give you these early signs that we need to be aware of. So if you've got a repeated defoliation from gypsy moth um, or you've got drought, I mean, it'll be really interesting this year to see what's going on because technically we're in a drought right now. Um, although it's been kind of cool and we had a rainy day, uh, we are about three to four inches behind uh, an annual precipitation from last year and the year before that. So it'll be interesting. Usually when we have a droughty time, these pests and pathogens kind of, you know, that they, they aren't as prevalent. But if we have a cool, wet spring, boy, these pathogens can just pop up and hang out. So this is what I mentioned about the changes in the weather patterns. Over on the left-hand side, you've got the observed spring precipitation. So look from 1990 all the way to 2014. I mean, you're starting to see the total precipitation increasing. So we're getting more springtime precipitation. We're getting more humidity at night during uh, the springtime. That also contributes to those fungal pathogens staying around and also being able to grow because um, during the springtime, what happens is when the temperatures warm up and you've got a rain event, those spores open up and they can travel up to the, into the trees. Springtime temperatures are increasing as well. So you're starting to see a real pattern starting to exist here. Dieback versus decline. So fine twig dieback up on that staghorn. So you're starting to see that top little branches um, stick out. That is an indication that trees are stressed. They're reduced growth. They have shrubby uh, appearance. And I think that that is what we need to be looking for in field identification, certainly in some of these high quality oak hickory woodlands that we have, if we know that these trees are stressed and you can see from a distance that that fine twig dieback is hanging up because two line chestnut borer starts at the top of that tree and it works its way down. And two line chestnut borer gets in underneath that bark and it disrupts all that nutrient flow going from the below ground to the above ground. Secondary pest, two-line chestnut borer. We see this, this uh, tree, to be honest with you, when I first saw this picture, I would never have thought it was two-line chestnut borer. I, I just, it wouldn't have been, I would have said that it came from the nursery and it was improperly planted and it probably has, you know, the ball and the, the burlap and the basket still on it. But upon further just uh, review and kind of we dissected this tree, underneath the bark, you're starting to see all the larval galleries. And this tree was just ravaged by two-line chestnut borer. And so it's really important. There is treatments for two-line chestnut borer. I don't have uh, a current pesticide license, so I don't really discuss uh, pesticide applications during a public presentation, but there's a lot of information, you know, certainly contacting uh, Extension or, you know, any of the Illinois arborists, they would be able to provide you Department of Natural Resources as well. 
But knowing that two-line chestnut borer can come in when these trees are stressed out and actually just seal the deal, go in and disrupt all of that nutrient movement is, is really important to know. I think it's going to help us certainly in the next you know, year, two years, hopefully in the next five to 10 years, really start to address some of the oak decline before it becomes a significant issue. The tree can handle a little bit of pest activity, they just can't handle it when it's overwhelmed. Two-line chestnut borers over on the upper right-hand side, you're seeing that very familiar D-shaped exit hole. It's an agrylus species, so that D-shape is the shape of its head. Herbicide drift, I think this, this is uh, something that we're not going to spend a lot of time on today, uh, but if you do see any of this cupping going on, so when those leaves are, are, are cupped over and they're just kind of like almost like curled under, it potentially could be herbicide drift damage. So if you're close to any of the farm fields, agriculture, or uh, near anything that is being, um, if there's widespread spray going on, uh, it's really important that we get this information not to, to the Illinois Forestry Association or to the Department of Natural Resources. I know that Dr. Frederick Miller at uh, the Morton Arboretum and Joliet Junior College is collecting information as well. Uh, after the presentation, I certainly can put uh, Frederick's contact information and Chris, I know that you have the IFA information, but there's a real interest in trying to figure out how widespread herbicide drift damage is to our sensitive oak trees. So again, it's an emerging concern. It's something that we want you to be aware of. And if you are seeing it, if you could report it, we would greatly appreciate it. We're gonna move quickly into some of the diseases. So oak wilt, oak wilt, as I mentioned before, oak wilt is rampant all across the state. And over on the Western side, I, certainly in the last two to three years, we've just seen such an increase in the death of our beautiful old red oaks. And so being aware of uh, any type of, oftentimes, you know, when you start to see oak wilt, you can start to see it in just very, very small pockets. So you're looking at that, that tan, very uniform dieback from the tip of that leaf down towards the petiole or, the, or towards the stem. Oak wilt's deadly for red oaks. White, you know, it can take a little bit longer to, not a little bit longer, white oaks can sustain um, oak wilt for a much longer period of time. Oftentimes red oak will die within the growing season. So you're seeing the image of how uniformly it starts at the tip and then moves its way back into the margin, the center area of that leaf and then towards the petiole. What do we do? This is a, a fun image that I, that I like to show. Basically what happens is you don't prune oaks. If we want to start to limit the amount of oak wilt, we need to not trim oaks during the growing season. Basically what happens is that if you start to trim uh, that oak tree. That oak tree has this, this sweet, sappy odor, and it attracts all these picnic bees, these nutilid, I can never say that, um, and they have the pathogen on them. So they go to the tree, and then they start feeding on it, and they create a fungal mat, and then they go to the next tree, and it can spread. So these, these beetles that we have, they can spread this oak wilt, this pathogen, you know, from one tree to another, and it is really devastating. It also travels below ground. So if you've got, you know, red oaks or white oaks uh, right next to each other, those roots are connected underneath and that pathogen can spread below ground. So again, this is a really complex uh, pathogen that's tough to manage, but the one thing that we can do is not prune our oaks during the growing season. Uh, there is some, some research going on and it, it has been for, you know, for decades about the effectiveness of severing those roots. So just making a big trench and trying to separate the spread and, and decouple these trees that are close by. Um, it, it is effective in some areas and, and not in others. But again, uh, looking for those trained professionals, super helpful. Here's an image of the fungal mats. It's just what happens is that, you know, when you, you cut it and there's an attractant, it's gonna, those pests are gonna find it and they're gonna be the ones to spread that pathogen into that opened area. Early diagnosis, uh, diagnosis is really important. 
Again, you know, making sure that you don't prune from April to June. I probably would say only prune during the dormant season. So after that first hard frost, uh, and then probably not after um, maybe January or February. So you've got a really limited time. You can use fungicides. Uh, it is tricky. The timing in the application is very tricky and making sure that we always do good um, sanitation. So we're trying to make sure that we don't uh, split firewood, clean our tools. Um, the, the, the splitting in the firewood is those that you, you know potentially would have oak wilt. So I just wanna make sure that we're clear on that. Oak wilt versus bur oak blight. I know there's not a lot of bur oak in, uh, in Southern Illinois, but I do think it's important to kind of talk a little bit about bur oak blight, certainly because bur oak blight has persisted in, in the, the central to Northern Illinois over the last five to seven years. I mean, these, these bur oak trees are just being absolutely hammered by bur oak blight. We're starting to see bur oak blight occur on swamp white oak. So swamp white has a cross between bur oak and white oak. So again, it's now expanding its host range. So it's something that we need to be aware of. Um, Burrow blight, you know, to be honest with you, is, is kind of what we call that slow languorous disease. It can hang out for 10, 12 years. It really is most, of, uh, the, the trees that are most effective are Quercus macrocarpa oliviformis. So that olive shape, that tiny acorn shape. And that tiny acorn is often found in Iowa and Minnesota, but it's also important to kind of be aware of that characterized by um, upland sites. They are typically found in common, they cut common in parks, um, urban areas, but to be honest with you, we've seen it pretty widely di distributed from Indiana, Illinois, and then Iowa, and then into Minnesota. Symptoms, it's got that uh, perfect necrotic V-shaped wedge. Typically you're starting to see that and the end of the growing season, so July and August, you're starting to see this really, really uh, uniform wedge, that V-shaped wedge over on the right-hand side. Also during the winter, if you do see any bur oaks and they do have uh, their petioles still attached, if you see them, you can almost, if you can pull one off, you can take a look at it or find it on the ground. If they have black raised pustules, like the arrow is pointing to it, you know, that is a really good indication that that tree has burrow blight. Again, that thinning during the growing season, that's another field identification that we oftentimes use. This is starting from the top and moving down. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, diagnostics would say it starts from the bottom and moves its way up the top. So I've seen in both ways, it just depends on how uh, severe the uh, pathogen is and how much uh, remaining leaves that actually have all the pathogens from the year before, if they're all still, you know, hanging out around the bottom of the tree, oftentimes as they are in our more natural setting, you know, that's where that pathogen just continues to hang out. So uh, some of our urban areas, not so much, uh, but again, seeing that thinning of the canopy. Signs of secondary problems, we're talking about amylaria root rot, two-line chestnut borer, I'm gonna move through really quickly. We've got bur oak blight, bur oak blight lookalikes. If anybody's familiar with, a, with a, an oak leaf towards the end of the growing season, they know that it looks gnarly. They oftentimes have spots and it could be tabacchia, it could be oak anthracnose, or it could be a leaf spot. Um, management for bur oak blight, removing those trees, pruning them during the dormant season will help increase that tree vigor and get air circulated around it. Um, the pathogens, I just wanted to show you that, you know, to be honest with you, oak trees have a lot of, a lot of associations. There's a lot of things going on, but for the most part, if that tree is leafed out and, uh, and is healthy and is growing, I don't worry too much about some of these spots. Oak leaf blister, I mentioned this because uh, it, it's very similar. It's the same, typhrina is the same uh, family as the peach leaf curl, so that fungal pathogen that often affects our, our peach trees. 
The blister actually just is a raised puckering on the leaf and it is more of an aesthetic problem. It's also very cyclical. It'd be interesting this year to see if we have a lot of oak leaf blister given the fact that we're uh, having a little bit of a drier um, spring season. Oak anthracnose, uh, again, this is just something that's unsightly. I don't worry about oak anthracnose uh, very much. You're starting to see kind of it browning, kind of like looking at like a tan color, not very uniform. There's also can, uh, the oaks can, the leaves can dry out. Oftentimes there'll be leaf drop during the season. That tree is just kind of given up on that leaf. So uh, anthracnose typically occurs when we have a uh, cooler, wetter, drier, um, cooler, wetter spring. Some inf information. Oftentimes, um, oak anthracnose occurs on white oaks. Um, don't really see it much on red oaks, uh, but oftentimes it's just something that happens as a result of when the timing of leaf out. I put rapid white oak mortality uh, in, in here because I thought it was important that we continue to be aware of rapid white oak mortality. There's great research going on in Missouri, and I know that uh, hopefully they'll be, be able to publish some of their, their findings. Uh, every year we do an aerial survey. So Frederick Miller's Forest Health Lab sends up um, a technician to fly over from Southern Illinois into Missouri and kind of back and forth doing these swaths to look and see if there's any widespread oak mortality. Uh, Dr. Miller will tell you that he is concerned about the white oaks and, and the not rapid death, but the um, increased death in white oaks. And rapid white oak mortality basically was found on like a 12% grade slope. The soil was really thin, didn't have much water holding capacity. The 2012 drought, I think, really significantly impacted our oak population, not only in Northern Illinois, but Central and Southern Illinois, and as well as Missouri. I mean, that was really what most people start to think of as the tipping point for some of the oak declines and the issues that we're seeing right now. Management options, I think these are always good things to think about. I talked a lot about like pests and pathogens and what's impacting our trees. But if you can do what we always know and what we always want to do is we want to make sure that we take care, good care of these trees. So if there's too much water and you can fix that problem, if there's a drain or there's something that you know is that putting too much water, that soil getting saturated, it's reducing the amount of oxygen below ground, that's a big problem. Um, also, conversely, if there's a drought, dry summer, like we've had in the end of July all the way through August, we've had really, really minimal amounts of rain in comparison. Uh, so watering these trees where possible is really important. Protecting some of these old white oaks and, and red oaks as well, um, and more so on the white oaks. Protecting them from root damage is significant. There's a number of people in the industry that feel that these older oak trees are being negatively impacted by either equipment or by people or by you know, construction. So it's really important that you protect that whole root plate, if you will. So think about you know, looking up at that tree and seeing where the end of those fine twigs are and then just drawing a visual circle that's basically where all those roots are, your top you know, 12 inches of that soil. So any sort of compaction can really be problematic for these oak trees. I encourage people, again, no pruning, but encourage you to really establish a monitoring program. I think it's so important to, that we get out. We've got great tools right now that will help us do this monitoring. The more you look at that tree, the more you know that tree and the more likely you are to improve the long-term survivability of that tree. This is the, my, my last kind of like doom and gloom slide. I think I actually should have reversed them. Um, there's been a lot of conversation in the plant healthcare about root rot and Ganoderma and butt rot. Um, oftentimes we can't see 
this type of uh, fungus that's in the tree. It's rotting from the inside out. And what happens during you know, a wind event or a heavy rain event is that tree just you know, ends up toppling over because it's basically rotted on the inside of it. So making sure that you're checking that flare, the bottom part of that tree, making sure it's got good mulch around it. It's not you know, packed like a volcano, but rather a donut if you are mulching. Um, I know oftentimes in our forests, our woodlands, we just can't, you know, can't be manicuring these trees the way, way we'd like to, but noticing those trees that do have any of uh, uh, this fungus that are around it is really helpful. Gypsy moth, really quickly, we know gypsy moth. Gypsy moth has been with us for about 145, 150 years. That slow the spread program is extremely effective. This year, I think, you know, there's not going, there's only probably one or two uh, treatment blocks from the Illinois Department of Agriculture. So they've been a very effective in identifying those areas that have hot spots or have high incidence of um, uh, catches in their traps. Um, and thankfully this year, it looks like the population gypsy moss kind of on the downside. So hopefully that is the case. I know that they're going to be surveying all throughout the state. So we'll be anxious to get the results at the end of the summer to make sure that that population is kind of on that downside. So the cycle for the gypsy moss, basically every kind of eight to 10 years, if you will, what to look for, you're starting to see the forest effects during the growing season. If you do see that caterpillar, that caterpillar has five pairs of blue dots and six pairs of red dots. And it basically just eats from the outside into that leaf and leaves that mid, that mid vein uh, standing. Over on the right-hand side, you're starting to see those egg masses. Obviously that's an aerial view of what it looks like out east when you have a heavy defoliation. Gypsy moth is not going to kill the tree. It's going to be what starts to stress it. And if you add drought on top of repeated defoliation, you know that's just a, a bad indication of, of things to come. Again, looking at that thinning canopy. Identification, I mentioned it. There's the female and the male. The female is the white, the male is the brown. This is just an indication of the life cycle. So it starts out as a caterpillar and then it pupates uh, during the sort of end of June, beginning of July. And then the adults come out and then they feed, mate, and then they lay their eggs and they overwinter as egg masses. Again, you're starting to see these signs and symptoms. I'm gonna move really quickly into spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly, unlike gypsy moth, they're very similar in their life cycle with the egg masses, uh, but spotted lanternfly is out on the East Coast and it's a real pest of concern. And so uh, if you do see something that looks very similar to this, we definitely want you to report it. And I have that information at the end of my presentation, but it, spotted lanternfly is not here uh, in Illinois. Spotted lanternfly lays its egg masses, has a waxy coating. It's able to overwinter in our winters. This is what it looks like uh, from the previous year. The difference between spotted lanternfly and gypsy moth is that spotted lanternfly, those egg masses look like their individual cases, if you will. So sausage links all stuck together or tire tracks. Very heavy feeder will not kill the plant. It actually likes 70 different types of plants. So it goes from grapes to hops to, uh, it has been found on oaks, uh, tree of heaven. I mean, you name it, it is a generalist, but it is not a fly. It's a leaf hopper and it's a plant sucker. And so it sucks out all the nutrients during the, the really early part of the growing season. And it turns that tree like almost, or, and plant you um, chlorotic. And so it sucks out all the nutrients. And oftentimes you start to see those yellowing leaves, definitely have that tree evaluated or look at it more closely to figure out. And you can identify um, what is actually going on. So everything that that plant, you know, the spotted lanternfly sucks in comes out kind of as sooty mold and honeydew. So you're starting to see a real sticky residue on the leaves. I mentioned monitoring. iNaturalist is fabulous. I'm sure you guys know all about iNaturalist, but I would highly recommend that you use iNaturalist. It's got a lot of really good information on it. 
um, and it's really super simple and easy to use. Healthy Trees, Healthy City, if you're interested in forest health metrics, kind of monitoring your tree over a longer period of time, say you've just planted it, Healthy Trees, Healthy Cities app has a really great, uh, very easy to use system. So that's a good resource. I love phenological monitoring. The National Phenology Network is excellent. If you're really interested, they have some really good information on the spread of invasive species and forest pests. Resources, I like the keys of uh, diseases and oaks in the landscape. That's from the University of Georgia. Plant Clinic, the University of Illinois Extension has an excellent 12-page uh, uh, oak problems report. It's fantastic. I love it. Uh, I hope to be able to see you in person and hand you your own copy, uh, but I know it's available online as well. Morton Arboretum has a great plant clinic. They're always available. We answer over 35,000 inquiries every year. So over the phone, email, in person, you name it, uh, they are there. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has excellent plant health information, lots of great resources on invasive plants and pests. And then reporting. So I mentioned to you, if you see something, we want to make sure that you report it. So Illinois Department of Agriculture, Scott Shermer, um, or the main office, uh, or on, you know, over the website. Illinois Department of Agriculture is kind of the first line of defense in Illinois. So if there's a problem going on and you see something and you're concerned about it, definitely let them know. Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, so USDA APHIS, Greg Brenslers, our state plant health director, and my contact information is there. People always say, gosh, what can I do? You know, all this, the pests and pathogens, we're talking about climate, we're talking about, you know, really caring for and, and conserving these big, beautiful oaks that are part of our natural heritage uh, in Illinois. The number one thing that we can do is not move firewood. And I kind of put this up kind of as a, a kind of a, a funny reminder, if you will. Um, but to be honest with you, it really is the only thing that we can do in order to prevent the spread of invasive pests and pathogens. So don't move firewood. We want to conserve those beautiful native plants that we have here, the, especially the threatened and endangered and all of the other plants that we have growing in the state of Illinois. We have diverse uh, plant communities all throughout the state and you know, making sure that we do what we can not only to stop the spread, but also to monitor, you know, getting a better handle on what's happening year over year for um, our forested communities or trees in your, in your neighborhood, I think is really important. And that's it, thank you.